Welcome back to another Rational Politics. I'm joined at the table today by a new face and an old face. Let's do a few quick introductions. Talus, welcome back to the table. Thank you, Nigel. I appreciate being back. Reagan, good to see you down here. Welcome for your first time at the table. Hey, great. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Talus, why don't you start off? What did you discover when you tried to run for council? That's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, so I'll start off at the very beginning. I approach running for office similar to starting a business, and I've started many businesses. And you know, you get your paperwork in, then you try to build your team, you understand your, where you're positioned within the market. All those things apply directly into politics. However, the customer acquisition is very different. Uh, in business, you know, there's plenty of models for customer acquisition, but in politics, none of the models that I tried to use seem to work. So oh dear. <laughs> <clears throat> that could be a bit of a hindrance. Yeah. <laughs> so, Reagan, yourself, yeah. wh what did you discover when you were trying to run? You know, I guess similar to what Talis was saying, um, when you start, when there's something you don't know, you haven't done it before, you don't know what you're doing. And uh, I guess a couple of things I learned after the fact is, um, when they say that you can announce and run and get your paperwork, if you announce then, so let's say it's May or June of that year, that election year, you're already five, six months behind. Ah. Um, the People are not announced yet because you can't do it, but they're putting out the, I may be considered running, then they build up their team, they're starting to already do that groundwork. Uh, in our case, you know, when I announced, um, I felt there's a lot of support from the business community and people that I've known over time, but... Uh, at the same time, it's funny because they support you, they say good things, but it's getting that volunteer, it's getting out and canvassing neighborhoods, and, and that kind of fell on me and my wife and my three kids, and um, a lot of well wishes, but not a lot of help, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you probably heard the same thing, when I was, people were encouraging me and talking about the thing that they talked about was raising money. Here's the amount of money you have to raise. And uh, What did they tell you? Uh, $10,000. That's what I raised, and it didn't work. <laughs> uh, but they don't, they don't talk about the amount of, like, oh, you're going to have a lot of work, it's going to be really hard, but they don't talk about the amount of people you need behind you to help. Um, and in some cases, those people that want to help you have their own, you know, even like City Council Longmont's nonpartisan, the first question we get is, what party are you? <laughs> right. And I've never been affiliated. I have friends and supporters that are D's or R's or G's, or, you know, whatever. Like, so it's this weird, it's like it took me back to junior high and high school in some aspects where some people support you, but they can't do it publicly. Oh. Um, and, you know, even things as simple as, can you put flyers on your block for me? Here's 20 flyers. Can you at least hand them to your neighbors or post them on a door? So there's a lot of work um, getting that team put together. Like you said, when you start your business, you have to get your team first before you start the business. What Reagan said was super correct. I mean, it's not when you file your paperwork. That was my, one of my biggest mistakes is I started building the team after I officially declared. Mm -hmm. Reagan's right. I mean, it's a year commitment, not just the last six months. Right. Don't, don't you think that's, there's something a little bit wrong with that? And, and I'll give you an example in, in Great Britain, which of course I know quite well. There is a limit on, on the amount of time. Now, for a general election, six weeks, and that's for all the MPs. Everyone has to work on exactly the same uh, time scale. There's also, a, a, you know, you say $10,000, that is just under what a British Member of Parliament is allowed to spend. A British Member of Parliament, last time I looked it up, could only spend about fifteen to sixteen thousand dollars on his whole campaign. I also heard like the ten to twelve thousand dollar number for what I would need in order to to pull the election off. I raised uh, the money and I matched uh, money coming in, so I raised about you know six thousand, and then I put in a little over five of my own. The person who won uh, put in forty dollars into her own campaign. The machine that she was being supported by helped her raise 20,000. To run for council. For, to run for council. It sort of sums up everything that's wrong all the way through American politics. Mm -hmm. You should not have to spend that amount of money to run for council and, for and for be successful. Yeah. For, little, for little Longmont, right? Like, for little old Longmont, yeah. And people are recruited, you know, like she told me she was recruited for this. She had never thought about running prior to them coming to her um, because they thought that she'd be a good candidate. So, I mean, I think that getting the vested interests out of politics and making local city council truly nonpartisan 
would lead to better representation because the very first thing that she did when she was elected was cut the city council meetings by half because she didn't have enough time. Okay, so you run for council, but you don't have enough time to do council work. That doesn't seem to be correct. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, when someone only puts 40 bucks into their own campaign, like, what's the opportunity cost there? What sort of frustrations did you run into? Because, um, I mean, were any roadblocks put up? I'll, I'll take that one real quick. I'll let Reagan go yeah. in because I'm sure he has his own. But it's frustrating for me because the same person was running. Uh, so there's three, uh, there's two seats open for my city council at large uh, race. The two people who won and the mayoral candidate who won were all represented by the same group. They had the same campaign manager and the same people who were canvassing handed out all three people's flyers. Yeah, I think there's something similar to that too. I, I know, you know when I ran in 2019, my opponent and I were generally unknown overall. Like the people that knew us knew us really well, but overall in our, in our ward, um, I found it really interesting how many people would ask people that don't know me about me, and I could see it online, and they were just announcing things. I had um, I'd been a financial advisor. I had you know, my Series 7 and 66 license. I started from scratch an office here just helping normal people learn about finance and build their retirement, but a friend of mine had people canvas three times for my opponent. And you can't control what your volunteers say, but no. you, can, you can start to uh, sort of feel patterns. So if I was out with my family and we would knock on doors and meet people, I would say my opponent's name correctly. I would say what her job is. And then I would say, the reason I'm running is this, you know. And uh, a friend of mine had three canvassers come by and one time they, they told him, he asked, you know, he knew who I was and he just kind of played dumb and said, oh, who's the, who are they running against? Um, they... Uh, made an emphasis to mispronounce my name. Uh, some Regan, Regan guy, I don't know. Um, I was, he, he was told that I was um, a greedy Wall Street investment banker. I guess they took that from financial advisor. Um, <laughs> I have a real estate license, and one time they told him that I was a greedy, out of touch, you know, real estate developer. I'm not like normal people, I'm a rich developer. And the third time they came by, I've got um, three boys, but they told, they told my friend that um, I don't know much about that Regan guy, but he's got three kids with three women and doesn't pay child support. So that was one of the things I had is this, this just, just fake information, disinformation, and just other things like, uh, you know, that happen that, that you don't expect because for me, I feel like I ran a campaign like I would uh, run my business, uh, right. legal, ethical, how I would want to be treated, how I would want someone to treat my mom, those kinds of things that I grew up, those sort of rules of life. You know, so many signs stolen. I had, a, you know, <coughs> even though you could see what it was paid for and there was this big to-do about it, you couldn't, it wasn't big enough font. And one of our final debates, other candidates were telling me how my opponent was asking them to sort of team or, you know, complain about me or... They're just different things that you don't really expect when you're grown-ups. It's something you'd expect if you're running for, like, seventh grade student council. Or, or you belong to Trump. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's, it's either little kiddies or Trump. Well, it's this, interesting for, that you say that, because, like, that playbook that he has of, like, just say it over and over and over and over. And, and eventually like, they'll believe it. Some council members, pastor, candidates, like, you see them sort of say the same, like, so like wow, that's, like, straight from the... The Trump playbook. I, I am, I'm finding it so hard to believe that, that they would just lie through their teeth at this level. I, at one point, if you get beyond frustrated, and I started taking it as a compliment that I must be doing well because they're just grasping at straws. And uh, a friend of mine is in different meetings where they're talking about these council positions, and she was saying, like, they're nervous about your Ward 3. Like, they feel good here and here and here, but they're like, how about that? What's going on there? And so I just kind of took that as, hey, I came out unknown. I announced later in the spring. The opponent had a head start, and we came really close by the end. 200 votes, right? Um, something like that, yeah. yeah. So um, a lot closer than mine. It, it's interesting because you were told that you had to raise 10,000, you know, to, to stand a chance. We won't say to win, to stand a chance. The winner raised 20,000, and, and that puts running for city council out of reach for a lot of people in oh, this yeah. town. They would not have a clue how to do that. Um, we were talking off air about, you know, what a, what a British MP is allowed to spend on their election, something like eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 for an MP. To raise, have to raise 20000 for a city council seat. Hold on a second, something's wrong. Yeah, and they're only compensated like a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Why? Why so much money? Like, it's not even a paid position. It's not like Denver where they're making like hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Right. It, it has become their profession. 
in Denver. Yeah, and so, I mean, there is an argument to say that we should compensate city council members higher so that people who are more serious than people our age, it's easier for them to run because if you're retired, then you have your nest egg, you, your house is paid off, it's a lot easier. You don't have a job to balance because you need a job to pay bills. Like Exactly, right? We both had flexibility of owning our own businesses and we were able to do it, but not everyone has that flexibility. Yeah, that was something that came up a couple of years ago in council discussion. I think it was council member uh, Christensen had brought it up. It was in the Times call and some people are saying, yeah, they should get more money. Some people are saying, no, they already get too much. Some people are saying she just wants a pay raise. But it was minimal. It was like $200 a month or so. I forget the details, but I remember then Mayor Bagley was saying, if we're going to raise it, make it a full-time job. So people, um, I was in council that night. It was during the campaign, and I think he kind of pointed me out. And he said, so people that have a family or other people that can afford to do this. And because where it is now, it's almost like paid volunteerism. Like right. I was saying, being a substitute in St. Vrain District, it's like <laughs> you feel like you're volunteering. They get, you're an employee. They pay you, but it's like paid volunteerism. So there's more beyond it. Like it's not they're not doing this for the job of it. Is it for the power? Is it because, like you said, um, the people that are recruiting you, they want to have someone there that is going to help you know push buttons and pull levers or. It was also interesting because I learned something new. We had a, we had a council person in here uh, oh, a few weeks ago. She actually made the statement that really the city council is a toothless tiger. They're more a suggestion group rather than an actual planning group. It's all up to the town manager what he listens to and what he doesn't listen to. Well, they Do you give have guidance. any thoughts? Yeah, they give guidance to the city manager, uh, Harold Dominguez. I know him. Uh, I've met with him several times during the campaign. He's a very level-headed person. He seems to really know what he's doing. Um, so, I mean, you want someone who has, like, like the logistical knowledge and, like, the institutional knowledge of, like, how things actually happen. Yeah, how it works. Yeah, especially if you have, like, these part-time you know, retirees who are on the city council who don't necessarily, you know, that's not their profession. You know, right. they're, you know, doing other things. I mean, some of them are very intelligent and very bright, and I respect them greatly. But, I mean, it's, it's different if, than if it's if your full-time job. Now, you just remind me of something he said. He talked about the city of Longmont as, like, a huge company, a conglomerate. And he was starting to describe it, um, and I thought of Pepsi, because you've got Pepsi, they've got sodas, they've got, they own Quaker Oats, they own Gatorade, they own Frito-Lay, they used to have the fast food before that was Yum Foods and split off. But in Longmont, you've got a power company, you've got a water company, Next slide. you've got an internet company, you've got a street maintenance company, you've got all these different companies, like you're saying, so you've got to be able to manage that, and if you take the makeup of a council and you've got... Uh, retired um, superintendent of schools. You've got someone that's a, you know an elementary teacher. You got someone who's an appraiser of homes. And they're experts in what they do and in, uh, they've done before. But have they ever managed an internet company? Have they ever managed a water treatment plant? So I think they have like the idea. They give guidance to the city manager and then their feedback and then review with them. And right, talking of housing, that raises an interesting point. I believe Longmont is trying to hit um, one hundred and twenty thousand residents. That, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, with what's happening in Boulder, mm -hmm. everyone that cannot afford to live in Boulder, which now is 99% of the country, <laughs> yeah. they decided they'd come and live in Longmont. Longmont is rapidly becoming a second Boulder. What are your feelings about local housing, how we can improve the situation, especially, uh, you know, low-cost housing? which we seem to be having less and less of. Sure. Well, that's a lot, of, a lot of questions in there. I feel like, you know, growing up in Boulder, I felt that happening probably 96. Like, I never will be able to live here. And uh, Louisville kind of sucked up some of that and became, like, outrageously expensive places that, you know, I rented a house out there when I was, like, 20, and it's been scraped and rebuilt. It looks like an office building. Mm -hmm. And so you see it just kind of emanate out. I remember my dad saying something about the billionaires have pushed the millionaires out of Aspen. Mm -hmm. and we were talking about, like, right. Avon and Edwards, and you just see this sort of like, kind of like, a, like, I'm picturing a sound wave just kind of moving out. And Longmont is sort of the last, it, you know, the last stats that came out, it still was the most affordable in Boulder County. Um, but it's exponentially getting, like, more so. Um, there's some market cycles, natural market cycles are, were disrupted with COVID to where, like, let's say someone's getting older, maybe they need more medical or day-to-day -day help or whatever, they might transition to assisted living or something like that, and then that house is sold and needs updated. It could be someone's new starter home. Well, when COVID hits, people aren't going to let mom or dad go to the isolation of an assisted living. They're going to help make care of mom and dad at home or whatever. So you saw that cycle sort of break. 
And then there's people moving around, working more remote, like we were talking off air. You know, if, if you don't need to live in San Francisco to have that job, then you can come here. So there's a lot of money from other places coming in. Mm -hmm. we're, we're perceived values, I think, are different. Like growing up here, I see a house and I think it's worth, you know, maybe, let's say, 500 Well, someone sold a place, let's say, in San Francisco for a million and a half. They show up, see it's 500 they don't want to lose the house. They're fine with throwing 700 at it because they still have a million in the bank from their other place. And it's bigger than they had before. They have more square footage. But the people, like everyday people, first-time buyers, people with just normal day-to-day -day jobs, like they just see it like, I, I remember saying a few years ago, I make a dollar more, things cost $2 more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's definitely market disruption that <clears throat> is really out of whack. Um, there's some things I think the city can be doing as far as making the process less expensive and quicker on the supply side. I know I'm talking to a lot of people that are just local builders here in town, you know, not like KB Homes or not these publicly traded companies, but normal people here and they talk about the red tape, how much time it takes, how much money it costs. They've built a job and they've planned it out and designed it and by the time they get approval, costs have changed so much that it's no longer, like there was one project that was completely canceled that was gonna have um, beyond the permanently affordable units, they were gonna have about 20% and it's 12% is the requirement by the time they got to the end of it, they couldn't afford the project with that 20%. They ended up doing 5% and paying a fee in lieu instead. Ooh, so yeah. they'd lost the units of housing. And, um, and, and I think they need to update too because I find clients of mine that can qualify for the income for some of these, they don't necessarily qualify for the loan. And some that are qualifying for the loan make too much money to qualify for that particular house. So there's some things out of yes. balance there too. See, I, I was in the reverse situation to your San Francisco um, example. I was living in Hernsville, Alabama. So uh, the company I was working for at the time bought a company out here in a gun barrel and they asked me to move out here. To me it was the total reverse of someone moving from San Francisco because the mansion, and I kid you not, that I had in Huntsville would sort of buy, get me a double wide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. My son. Worked his heart out. He's having trouble living. Yeah. Here in town? Here in town. Yeah. It's, it's very difficult. I mean, luckily there's organizations like Eric Wallace's Prosper Longmont that's uh, designed to help people get into homes. And there's obviously Habitat. And uh, during my campaign, I talked to, you know, um, the head of Habitat locally as well as people who've uh, used their services. My dad was a general contractor, so... You know, I'm very familiar with construction. Um, and you're right, a lot of my supporters were contractors and developers, not the big ones, but the local ones. And they have little to no um, opportunity to build because of the red tape that is preventing them from doing developments. I've heard three years as being uh, delayed uh, in terms yes. of timeline. And that's it's hard to cover the capital costs if you're you know a developer because you have you know, the land that you've purchased, you have all the equipment, you have the, you know, the, the things that are going to be required to build those properties. So, I mean, I, I think that there's things we can do in order to make it easier, like 3D printed homes. We should look into that. We should look into modular things. We should look at ADUs, making it easier, or even help subsidize some of the costs of building ADUs on some of the larger what properties. What is ADU? Additional dwelling units. Oh, okay. So like a small rental on your, like converting your garage into a... Oh, I see. Or something like that, right? Like a, like a granny annex. Exactly. Yeah, like a little cottage yeah. home. Or... Like all the homes in Prospect have one, basically. So, I mean, it's, and especially with, you know, baby boomers getting older and, you know, people our age getting into the housing market, it makes sense for people to, to have an ADU so that, you know, mother-in-law suite. The other thing I wanted to address is uh, free movement uh, of people. I, I think that, um, well, just in my personal history, my grandfather left Ukraine uh, when he was young to Canada for economic opportunity. My father left Iran uh, to escape persecution, but also for economic opportunity. Uh, family moved from Canada to Southern California for economic opportunity, but I started a construction company and we were able to build some wealth there. I then moved to Northern California for uh, education opportunity, moved to Boston for my MBA for education opportunity, and then moved here because I fell in love with the community. So, you know, I, it's difficult for some people to uh, perceive the opportunity of moving somewhere new because they've, this is all that they know, but 
that's one of the great things about having, you know, the United States be so big and with so many different places is that if you maybe not finding a place here, there's other places. Like Tulsa, Oklahoma was paying people $50,000 to move there uh, to buy a house. One other topic I think I'd like to discuss because we've mentioned education in the past. What do you feel about this revisionist history that they're trying to teach in schools? As if they don't want to actually admit that this is the racism that they did. Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think that revisionist history, especially in southern states, is, is, is not good, like talking about trying to glorify the, the slavery period of time within the U.S. history. That should be you know, not done. However, in San Francisco, they're renaming a lot of schools, even people like Abraham Lincoln. I saw that. There's, I think we should all kind of focus on being moderate in the middle and not either of the extremes. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of safe spaces because like in college campuses, you can't have a intellectual discourse with people because you might offend them. Like thoughts and concepts should be open. Otherwise, how are you going to be exposed to new ideas, even if they are vulgar? I think that freedom of speech is important. Politicizing education is kind of like what you made me think of again, too. People are like, you know, if you feel like you're taking too much away from someone's cultural history, you're like na changing the names of schools, like Abraham Lincoln, I saw that and I was just like, wow, like, I don't, for me, I always think if you're going to make a policy, you're going to do something, I think, what is the outcome that you want? What do you want to have here? Do you want to teach people what really happened? Um, I think that there are some people, and it's funny, most of the TV news I see is when I'm at the gym, so I'm reading uh, titles, and it's funny because they'll have like Fox and CNN next to each other and it, like bounce <laughs> back and forth. I feel like there's some people that think like, you're trying to make us feel bad for something we didn't do in the past. Don't t teach us this. And then there's a group of people that say, hey, you're just ignoring what happened in the past. So I think somewhere in the moderate, like, you know, I, growing up in Boulder, it, you know, Boulder in this area is a different thing. I, we went and visited my wife's grandparents in Oakdale, Louisiana. It's the first time I heard anybody just throw down the N-word. I was like, wow, that's so weird to me. And I did interviews with the candidates for council last time. One of the um, at-large candidates, uh, Jeremy Johnson, he was talking about in Alabama, his grandparents ordered their Burger King at the back door and they gave him an unmarked paper bag because mm. they didn't want other people to know they were serving uh, African Americans, they don't want like no black people are getting served here. So like, which to me is so foreign, right? I I couldn't, I was like wrap my head around it. So I guess that being said, like we all have our own experiences, we all have our own background. You know, I I think people need to know what was really going on, and maybe that compromises like, you know, I don't know, are you renaming Abe Lincoln School? <laughs> but the compromise is like if people feel like you're you know dragging us through the dirt for something we didn't do versus you're just polishing a, a turd, right? Like, it, like, like, there's a business book. It's it is, um, like not eat the frog, but uh, it's in sales. It's like and they were talking about pricing, and they're just like, here it yep. is. Like this is what it happened, and and then have conversation about it, and and maybe it's the age of, that they're starting it or like the content that they're bringing out, but. I mean, it is I mean, what I, it is. I, history is history, right? Like, history is special. history. I mean, I'm a Brit. The British Isles has done a lot of bad things in the past, and not just in one place, all over the world. Opium wars in China, India. Look what look what we did there. Um, the Southern Irish uh, potato famine. Look what we didn't do there. But it was taught to us just like that. It was given to us straight as a history lesson at school. Kids have to know the truth. If they're not told the truth right up front, why should they bother? Oh no, we can just, we can just have alternative facts whenever we want them. It's funny you say that a niece of mine, I remember she was saying something on social media, and I forget what the question was, but there was um, someone from history and, and slavery in the South and civil rights, and she's like, why didn't I know this? And I'm like, I don't know where you went to school, but I knew that one. So, I mean, there's also differences in where we're going to school, and. Um, if there's homeschool or people right. can pick what they want, like I know, talking to a college professor of mine, um, she she was talking about like grading papers and like saying like this is wrong and the kids like and stuff that's like chemistry. So it's like this is what it is. The molecule is this. Yep. And the students would not say, oh, can I do it over? Like let me give it a chance for makeup. They'd say, well, not in my opinion. <gasps> and she's like, organic <laughs> chemistry isn't an opinion based thing. Like that's maybe literature. Like read something and then write your opinion about. It. I think this yep. because and there are some things that are just like this happened on this day in history. This happened. This happened. Growing up as a kid, I know that you know we dropped atomic bombs on Japan. It wasn't like. They, something that was 
shiny or fluffed up, you know, like you're saying, the, talking about British history, we did this. And that's how we did it. End of story. There Just teach kids the truth. Because what, what are they going to think when they get a bit older and discover all of a sudden that what they were taught at school was an absolute bullshit? Being a Brit, I think all Americans should stop talking about the War of Revolution. Because us Brits are getting really pissed off about it. I mean, we, we don't want to hear it anymore, so stop teaching it in schools. Totally wrong. Anyway, that's just me. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me here at the table. Talis and Reagan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Nigel Abes, your host. I'm signing off. Thank you once again for listening or watching another Rational Politics. Thank you.